Welcome back to the Demystify Side podcast. I'm your host, Anastasia. I'm Michael Shadow. And today we have a guest who almost needs no introduction, but I'm going to give one anyways. We have today with us Michael Levin for the second time, and we continue the conversation in many ways where we left it off last time. We dig into intelligence, we dig into will, we dig into AGI, we talk about the way that a philosophical perspective on science is necessary in order to be able to even ask the questions that are worth answering and come upon something that's really, I think, vital for anyone who is focused on trying to understand the world, which is that your model for why things happen is only as useful as how far it gets you. Which is to say that if you have a perspective on the world, that things happen for a certain reason, that there's a mechanism that underlies everything, and you try to use that as a lens for looking at the world, you have to make sure that that lens is actually getting you farther down the road. And I think that that's really at the heart of why Michael Levin's work is so interesting, because he's taken a lens that is verboten in the sciences, the will of individual cells, the will of an organism, the desire to be something ascribed to non-human entities is almost a dirty word. And yet it's so effective. And that's what I love. It subverts the expectation of what you will get out of that kind of lens. And he does it magnificently. And you are going to love the conversation. I love the conversation. Yeah. And it reminds us to be really careful in our language when we discuss ideas and it, it reminds us of boundary conditions and theories and you don't try to explain everything all at once or you get nowhere. And so if you, if you bound these conditions to statements and you stop trying to make these hard statements and get obsessed with life versus non-life and you really start to think of it as a continuum and you start to think about the processes that underpin that, you can actually find yourself able to answer the specific questions that might move you forward in your understanding of nature as a whole. So anyways, this was an awesome conversation. I think you guys are going to love it. Let us know what you think, questions you have. We'll meet up with Dr. Levin again in the future. So tell us what we missed and share it with somebody too. That's the only way we're reaching people. The algorithms aren't really helping us. We're not polarizing enough or whatever. So please share the podcast or you know leave a comment. Give it one of those little thumbs up things. Um, and then if you really love all that, consider joining our community over at Discord. There's continual conversation going on about all these topics. And if you really, really love it, consider becoming a patron and you can hang out with us. Uh, we do a weekly in-person meetup and there's all sorts of cool stuff going on there. And we're obviously trying to build this towards a bigger institution where we can give grants eventually too. So all that money is going, even if you can only give three bucks or whatever, it's going to go into building something much bigger and uh, more useful, hopefully, to this entire community in the future. Enjoy the conversation. We'll see you next time. The scientific revolution starts now. There are many people who have had very profound ideas over the years, and a lot of these are just not known at all. They've made very little impact. Nobody's heard of it. It hasn't gone anywhere. No, nobody knows about it. And so <clears throat> for me, it's really important that we try to uh, take the things that we're doing and make practical impacts out of it so that, so that a, a, most importantly, because I want to help people, but, but also because if, if this stuff stays in a purely philosophical kind of um, uh, realm, I mean, I, I could... I mean, I, I could have said many of the things I say today, I could have said them 30 years ago, and many other people have said similar things before that, but it would have been empty because, because nobody, nobody would care because uh, these are just, you know, thoughts. It's easy to say stuff. The, the trick is to find a way to make these things actually help research. And so <clears throat> for me, that's very important. And I also feel like it gives me a little bit of... Um, uh, gives me a little bit of 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 of, uh, of ammunition with with folks who are skeptical of the ideas, and then I say, well, that's fine, but let's see what your framework does, and let's see what my framework does, and then everybody can decide, right? It's like it's 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 what kind of research and what kind of new capabilities does do different ways of thinking unlock, 
right? And and that's 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 how you judge which are the useful ideas, right? Is what does it let you do next? You know, and I th- I think that's very important because a lot of people have very um kind of conceptual uh, um commitments to things, uh, and I'm saying yeah, that's good, but but actually let's just see what the practical impact of these are. And as far as successes versus failures, I mean, look, we've had we've had a lot of things that didn't work out, um, but overall, I'm like big picture, I'm kind of stunned at um, where we've gotten to. I think I, I sometimes I sometimes think of and 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 by the way, everything we've done is like five percent of what what I would like to do. So so I can sort of see it forward, and from that perspective. I think, oh my God, we've barely like scratched the surface. Like I can, cause I can see where this is supposed to go. And, and I'm like, oh, we've barely scratched the surface. But on the other hand, looking backwards, I'm thinking, wow, if I were to, if I were to show all this to, you know, um, you know, 1985, Mike, I would have been like, really that all that worked like amazing. So, you know, so, so from that, from that perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy, but regardless, uh, looking forward is, is more important. And so, and so this is just like ba- baby steps still. To, to what's what I think is possible. Do you think that the technological application is the real victory of this kind of work? Like if you're working in a different realm of science, like, I don't know, geology or something, it'd be more difficult to produce something that was immediately applicable to people's lives. But it, it seems like you're fortunate to be in a space where something like regenerative medicine is the holy grail of putting people back together and it's almost like if you can pull off something practical there's no way to deny the science essentially right and and i'm in no way putting down anybody who works in a pure field right so so pure mathematics geology whatever like so i'm i'm in no way putting any of that down but um you know m- my working in regenerative medicine isn't luck it's i in i i i went into this area precisely because i sort of asked myself where might these these really um, unusual ideas be be actually helpful? And and this idea of treating uh, or, or or viewing cellular collectives as a kind of intelligence with which you can uh, communicate, which are trying to navigate this anatomical morphous space, all of that came from thinking about okay, so how do these ideas uh, in, impact the real world? What, what, you know, what, where, where am I going to, you know, if they're going to be of any value, we're going to squeeze some, some actual utility out of them also because, also because it will make it more obvious that, 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 that we're onto something. But, um, that, that, that was, that was part of the reason that I'm in regenerative medicine is because I think here is an area where these ideas actually, uh, do drive novel research. And, um, that's not obvious to, I mean, to, to, to everybody, people, people have said to me before. You know, we, 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 we really like your data and these new things, but, but we should stop talking about all this, you know, kind of philosophical stuff. Like, don't do that. Just, just, just do the, you know, just do the data. And it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like that old joke of telling um, the, uh, the publisher that they'll make more money if they just publish the best sellers, right? It's a little bit like that. Like, yeah, at the end of it, you'll see the data and you wish you just had the data without all the philosophical stuff. But guess what? We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have this if that's if that wasn't the way we thought about things. We've we've done ma- many things in my lab that are only um, <clears throat> they're only we we only were able to do them because we think in these ways. If we didn't think about them, we wouldn't have done it. So so I actually think it's a very important sort of feedback loop between the conceptual, like you know, kind of the deep conceptual stuff and the practical n- nitty gritty of making things work. Mm. Do, are, do you feel unique in that sense that you run your lab? in a different way than others that might not make space for that? Or do you think no, that that's I, I a pretty, is that pretty yeah, common? No, no, I don't, I don't feel unique about, about any of it. Um, it's not super common. That's for sure. Um, but I'm hardly the first person to, to, to have that, that approach. It's, it's, it's hard to pull off. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think, uh, I've, I've been fortunate in many ways. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm certainly not the only person trying for that. I want to go back to go back in time and and ask about the the genesis of this philosophy, right? Because I feel like it's something that's kind of transgressive in biology to talk about the will of cells. Yeah. And so, when you what happened? What led you to first even start thinking about it? Yeah, um, and I'll, I preface that by saying that again. Uh, I am not the first person to think this way. This used to be a much more um, allowable 
way to go. And But in the last 50 years or so, I would correct, say that it's clamped correct. down to a degree that it's like to talk about the, yeah. even to talk about the <clears throat> will of like an animal is almost yep. like, yep. who are you to put that anthropomorphic perspective on a creature? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and again, there have been pioneers, you know, people like Barbara McClintock and other people who have really, um, you know, uh, had the, maintained that perspective all, all along. Um, I think that, uh, well, a couple of things. So, so one of the, one of the, uh, key things about all of this that, that I sort of insist on is moving it from the realm of philosophical arguments to the realm of empirical testability. So in my framework, which is, which is this thing called TAME, right? This, this technological approach to mind everywhere. I, I basically say that, um, any, any time that you try to make uh, claims in this area so that something is not cognitive, it, is, it, it does not have, you know, you name it, whatever, whatever um, you know, terminology you want to use, um, or, or you say that it does, you, you, you cannot have philosophical feelings about these things. You have to make a, you have to make a hypothesis. Here is the problem space. Uh, and in this problem space, this particular system, I think, does or does not do certain things. And then we test it and then we find out. And what we find out is whether or not that way of thinking about it has given you new capabilities, new ways of relating to the system, new prediction and control, new inventions, and so on. So then, if you know uh, the 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 tr the trick is if you're going to say that, uh, let's say cells or tissues or whatever it is, if you're going to say that they have goals or that they have memories or that they have preferences or whatever, it's on you to say that. Uh, Here's what I get by using that framework. What 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 do you get? I can do new things, and and conversely, you know, conversely, if somebody says no, that's ridiculous. They don't. It's on you to show that that proving that they don't is taking you in 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 better directions. So so this is all this is all um, very um, I think has to be has to be empirical, and so we cannot have these dis you know these these arguments and these discussions without a very specific. Like so, so what I do when I talk about these things, I say this: this is my claim, and here's what that claim has let me do. And 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 if you don't like the claim, that's fine. But tell me why you didn't do that experiment, and what other experiments does your framework let you do? So 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 that's it. I'm sort of always looking forward into into uh, what what did, what what does this way of seeing enable you to do? And I think that some of these terms, I, I kind of flip them around a little bit. Um, uh, you know, this this business of uh, of anthropomorphism. Um, I, I think that, uh, it's, it's the, the only way that exists is as a kind of limiting stencil in which we assume that the only things that are, um, like us in important ways, meaning intelligent, meaning having goals, you know, whatever, uh, they have to be like us. They have to be big brainy things that, that sort of, you know, lo look like us and, and we're, we're, um, had the same origin story as us. And, uh. That's that's it. I mean, other, other otherwise, it just boils down to this belief that humans are magic, and that you should be ashamed of you know somehow even thinking that 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 magic extends to other you know other kinds of uh, uh, systems that 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 are not us. I think that's a that's a profound mistake. Something that that makes me think of is. I've been recently working on a piece on the 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 possibility that the origin of life is actually from the planet itself, where it's like life ascends from the depths to the surface. Like it seems entirely plausible. But one thing that I came across was I was trying to make an argument about the the tendency to mistake the uh, living for non-living. And I realized that we don't actually have that problem. Like, it's actually a pretty rare problem for us to point to something and be like, that's not alive. Like a random human or a baby or anybody, really. Or even a cell, right? Like, you, you come upon something slimy and you're like, that's probably alive. Like, there's not... The history of science is not scattered by a history of mistakes about the living status of an entity. There's a couple of places, right? Like, you have... Bones are alive. They were thought to be inert. Teeth, ligaments, cartilage, these, you know, things that things that feel like they shouldn't be alive, but actually when you crack them open, you discover there's something regenerative in them. There's also like nanobes, which are 
mysteriously ambiguous where they stain with DNA, but they're so small and they don't seem to have any structures. But the the way that I want to wrap that back is that, okay, so we don't tend to have a tendency to mistake things that are alive for things that are not alive. But yet we do have a tendency to mistake things that have will and cognition and mind for things that don't. Why? Yeah, um, well, a couple of things there. Um, one is, uh, e- even on the live part, so I, I, I pretty much with, with, every, with, with uh, everything, I, I don't like binaries. I don't like binary categories. So I don't know what use it is to try to make um, living and non-living into a sharp category. I don't know what that, I mean, there's certainly people who work on that and, 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 that's, and that's fine. So, so maybe there are other places, maybe there are places where that's useful, but um, uh, I, I, spend, I spend no time trying to figure out a crisp definition of that. Um, I, am, I am very interested in the spectrum of cognition for, and, and, and um, how, how mistakes are made, as, as you just said, how mistakes are made on that spectrum. And so I think, I think there's two ways to make a mistake on that spectrum. One is to um, guess low and one is to guess high, right? So, so, so type one and type two errors. And so uh, all throughout science, the claim has been, this is sort of Morgan's canon, the claim has been that, that guessing high is way worse. So always guess low. So people say, you know, chemistry, everything should be at the, at the level of, of, of chemistry. Um, you know, always, always go for the mechanical explanation, the, you know, the, the, the kind of this, this, the kind of simple chemistry, um, chemistry kind of, kind of explanation. Um, and, uh, and, and I, and I think that's also a, a, a huge, and, and, and I think where that comes from is the desire of science at the beginning when, when science was being formalized to get away from the kind of primitive uh, slash religious ideas, which just assumed that, um, uh, that, that, uh, you know, the, the, there were um, these, these inexplainable, you're right. So, so, so humans and some angels and some other stuff was, was sort of like this, this thing that could not, was not well integrated into the physical world. There was a rift. There was a, there was a complete break and right. And and we've been trying to get away from that, and and this idea that that no, we can come up with rational explanations for things that rocks don't fall because they want to fall, but because of these uh, like that was we, we everybody was trying to sort of ex- and I think I think maybe Carl Sagan w- wrote about this uh, to to kind of exorcise these things from the physical world, and I think that might have been necessary at the time to get to where we are now, but we now need to build back up. Because, because in an important way, the that 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 baby got thrown out with the bathwater there mm. in, in, in a in a fundamental way, and and so maybe that was important to get us to rigorous science. But now we need to understand that actually a lot of the conceptual frameworks that come from behavior science, that come from cognitive science, extend well beyond the typical brainy things that they're applied to, and they are useful other places. And it's time to 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 relax that that te- I, I call it teleophobia this 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 dread uh, concern that uh, you know how, w- w- what happens if we uh if we if we if we apply some of these uh, some of these concepts that are typically used with 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 uh, creatures and their be- you know advanced creatures and their behavior what happens if we apply those other places and they actually work right that mm-hmm. that that's a real fear i think that underlies a lot of this uh, a lot of this stuff well, well it's, it's, oh, go sorry no, no, go ahead. it's ironic that there's teleophobia that runs parallel to this crisis of meaning in the Western mm-hmm. civilization right now. And this, it's like, I almost see it as a pendulum that's swung too far. I think that's kind of what you're getting at is that we tried to remove all this superstition for fear that it would ruin our ability to make decisions in a material world. But then at some point we've completely removed the possibility that there are different scales of goal oriented behavior goal, different scales of will essentially yeah and, um, yeah i mean you know and, and we regained some of that in the 40s with cybernetics some of that started coming back in because because it became clear that it is no longer uh, 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 scary or mystical to have machines with purpose. That's what cybernetics was about. We have a good science of this now control theory cybernetics it, it is not magic anymore. We know that this is possible and um and yet, because of the anthropomorphism, people, a lot of people still insist on making these sharp um, categories. So, so people say things like this all the time. Living things are not machines. Um, 
you know, I, I, you know, we, we, that's, that's just a, whatever, a paramecium of, you know, a slime mold. That's not like, I mean, I have real goals. What do you mean that thing has goals? That's not right. <laughs> and so, right. And so, and I, you know, and, and then, and then, so you have to do this very basic kind of argument. I'm like, okay, well, let's walk you back till you were, you were a, an unfertilized oocyte. Did you have goals then? And so, and so fine. Tell me where, where did they sneak into this picture? I mean, it's completely untenable. Uh, this idea that, that we are these, these sharp, uh, that there are these sharp categories that just um, you know, cannot, cannot be transgressed. And, um, yeah. Uh, what do you make of the, the sort of the selfish gene theory of, of the world where the, the meaning and the goal orientedness is reserved simply for this replicon that wants more than anything to make more of itself? Um, uh, yeah, uh, so, so, so kind of my, my general take on a lot of this stuff is that everything is observer relative. So meaning is derived by the interaction of some system with an observer. So if, if, um, somebody wants to ha- to be an observer and have a reference frame in which, uh, that's what they focus on, you gain a certain amount of predictive power. And there's some cool stuff you can predict doing that. Um, you know, um, uh, in terms of in in genetics, you can you can actually predict some some cool effects that way, but you're missing a lot. And there are other frames that give you much more predictive power in other um, uh, in in other avenues that that uh, get, get completely far completely away from that. And I, I you know me me personally, I don't find that view useful at all. But 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 I know that it has some some utility. I think I think fundamentally, we just have to. Um, drop this idea that there's one correct way to view all this mm. and to say that i mean i have very little sympathy for that view personally but i do realize that it has a certain utility in in certain um uh, certain quarters so 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 fine you know that's that's one more lens that exists there are many lenses with which to view the world um i'm much more interested in 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 other lenses but meh, you know okay yeah it would be wonderful to, if that attitude was embraced in the future of science in general that there could the, be a plur- plurality yeah just the the plurality exactly of a perspective because i think there are many ways to look at a pile of evidence i mean that's the only reason we have trials right is because the evidence doesn't just speak for itself there's there always has to be this uh, interpretive level to making wow. sense of the world uh, one yeah, day i'd I, like I, to I, rename this project science court science court <laughs> the yeah. future I mean, the thing is that um, I, I, I want to sort of be clear. I'm what I'm not arguing for is a is a kind of free for all where everybody's opinion is equal. That's not what I'm suggesting, right? So, so I'm suggesting that we still that that there still is a uh, a, a really important uh, evaluative element in terms of. So, how is it working out for you? This view that you have, right? Mm. It's not just that any old thing goes. It's that. Uh, let's take a look at multiple perspectives and ask what the relative uh, benefits are in terms of driving new understanding, new research, integrating knowledge. Um, and then, and then we find out, right. Which one. So, so this actually going back to this, this idea of, of the kind of the pre-scientific world, this, um, this, this is a good example of this. And, and, uh, you know, there, there are all there are all kinds of people that are in, in, interested in, 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 you know, sort of various things outside of science that when I say certain things, they say, Oh, no kidding. We've known that for thousands of years, you know, or, oh yeah, somebody already, you know, somebody already said, well, it's one thing to say something. It's something else to understand it to the point where you can actually make use of it, uh, in a, um, uh, in, in a way that, uh, in a way that gives you new capability. So for example, y- yes, there is, I, I, I do think there is an interesting sense in which, um, rocks rolling down hills do have a kind of goal directed capacity that I, I, there is I, I do think there's something to that however the old notion that every rock had a spirit in it that the rain and the sky that you know all this stuff the thing about that is it didn't give you any extra it didn't give you any extra um benefits so so just because you you know a thousand years ago if you were to say that you know yes there's a you know there's a there's a there's a spirit in the rain and in every tree we, you know i'm not sure what you could have done with that but 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 for example understanding what potential i think that you could have done a lot with that because if you look at the erasure of uh of 
inhabited spirits, you have the erasure of reverence for mm. nature. Like Francis Bacon, I've, I've said this before in the podcast, Francis Bacon describes the process of science as taking nature by the forelock and not to do nice things to it. Mm. Right? It's the, it's the mastery. Yeah, that goes back to the crisis of meaning business a little bit. I think so, yeah. So it's like the mastery of, of mankind over nature is inherent in the modern project, which is that we can mine whatever we want, cut whatever we want, extract whatever we want, and we can do that because there's no god of the rocks who'll destroy us for doing it. And so I agree with you that there's not like a functional thing where it's 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 hard to imagine a technology that you will build, but in the sense of like an ecological knowledge, I think that that might be something that yeah. is m missing to our detriment. And just like sensing identity with your surroundings, right? And really, because I mean, it is true. I've said it a million times on the show, but like you can't actually exist without the trees outside. So like to see them as separate from you is useful in some situations, but it's not totally realistic on its face yeah. either. And on top of that, there's also the sort of the recognition of the way that we live our lives on top of a landscape rather than inside of it. Like we went to the woods the other day and we brought a, like a lunch with us. What was lunch? It was cucumber, tomato, like a bagel. And as I'm sitting there and I'm eating it and I'm looking around, I, there was salmon. So I guess we could have gotten the salmon from the river, but I'm looking around and I'm like, this is so anomalous, right? Like to have lived on this landscape as somebody who is of this landscape, these foods, the cucumber is like three feet long. Like this is, this is a, a gargantuan anomaly. And yet I sit here, eat it contentedly. And there's an isolation from the landscape that is inherent to modernity. And I think that that's what we lost with the spirits. Yeah. So, so I don't disagree with any of that. Um, actually, I think, I think that's, that's right on the money. Um, what I would add to it, though, is that I, and and again, not to not to put down other ways of knowing and all that. This is just kind of where 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 I come from. Um, I think that where we can go to next is a place where we actually have much more of a contact with the thing that you're talking about, in, grounded in a much more um, convincing, rigorous, practical way than we had before. So it sort of circles back around, but it isn't a circle. It's a sort of spiral in a way, right? Because because back then the 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 problem the problem with all of that was that it was vulnerable precisely as you point out to the people who say, what? I don't see I don't see anything there. Therefore anything goes, right? We are getting to a place where that will not become a, sci a scientifically um uh, a tenable worldview. And and therefore mm. I think it'll be a much stronger basis on which to place all of the things that we want to place, which is, you know, the, 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 the harmony, the reverence, the, the, you know, coexistence, all that kind of stuff that you're talking about. I think we can have a better foundation for it. Once we really understand what do we mean that, um, that there's really agency in these systems, in these ecosystems, right? It's, it's very, it's very easy to say that, you know, this, this ecosystem is a being, but it's something else to be able to, to, to practically quantify and say, there's no getting away from it. You can see what are the memories, the goals, the learning capacity, the, the behavior, like, like th there, there it is. We now have ways of, of, of at, for anybody to see, whereas before it was, you know, sort of a few rare gifted individuals, right. That may have been able to perceive these things. It is soon going to be, there it is for, for everybody. Now, now we can all see it. And so, so that's, you know, that's, that, that was my only point. I don't think these things aren't real. I just think that, um, we're going to be in a much richer, uh, you that, that and, and and for the same reason that I don't think you lose a lot of people feel that when science explains something you know it sort of loses its you know its its majesty and whatnot I mean I think that's preposterous I, th I think the better you understand something th that gives you a much better way to to um to relate to the uh to the to the awesomeness of it you know yeah, I think people are just scared because science makes these really s certain cold claims that often do evolve with time and people are worried about getting trapped into missing something. I, I think that's why they're skeptical of, of they're that approach. They're also a, a spiritual, right? So like science has a tendency to explain things w like, like I said earlier, without the notion of will or agency. It's that there is this cold, hard world of material objects bumping into each other, and that's a world that doesn't have much magic in it. And people intuitively sense that it's not quite that simple, right? People sense in their daily lives that there must be something more to this. 
And so I think that mo modern scientific explanations create attention because you have somebody who is coming through and they're like, this is the mechanism for how this works. But the mechanism is alienating because it lacks the internal lived experience of what it is to be to be alive and in touch with something divine right because i think that the minute that you start thinking about the universe as having is being inhabited by an infinite number of entities with will that are all madly careening towards making things exactly as they are that is deeply meaningful and deeply spiritual but if there's no meaning to the universe, if it's just this thing that's bo that, you know, it was born, it will die, but everything that happens inside of it is just kind of the, like, I don't know, shit happens. Stuff bumping into itself. Yeah, it's just, it's it's so alienating. And I think that that's what alienates people. It's like science. alienating on a prosaic level, too, right? It's just like, even every everybody's boring day-to-day -day lives don't really reflect that sort of process. They're full of frustrations and, you know, deviations and... And it's really a fight, even on a yeah. boring level. Yeah, I, I um once uh, I I don't know I don't know what, this is what what came over me, but I once um wrote this kind of weird. It's one of the few uh non non one one of the few non scientific things that that I've ever written was like this little um uh conversation slash train of thought between uh, two neurons in a brain, and uh, and the one neuron says to the other one. Yeah, you know, we live in this uh, cold mechanical universe that doesn't care what we do, and there's no there's no intelligence out there. There's no agency. It's just like we're little cogs. And the other neuron says, you, you know, I'm not sure. I, I get this weird feeling that we're part of this giant, you know, universe that does like learn and care about what happens. I don't know because because every once in a while, this like wave of back propagation like washes over, and the other one says, yeah, that's just you know, like suffering is random stuff. Like, and the other one says, no, I, I, I really get this weird feeling that it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it's there for a reason that it wants something. And so, and so you look at this, right. And so this is, of course, this, this debate that people will, will have with each other all the time. You know, do I, does the universe teach me lessons or is the universe cold and mechanical and, and, you know, are, are, are we, are we learning because there's nothing out there or are we being trained because there's another agent on the other side of it? Right. So is there some kind of like, well, like how much agency is there in the environment? And you can just see in that example that in that in in that particular case, the first neuron is just flat out wrong because because they do in fact live in the universe, right? They're they're part of a learning system, a brain that does have preferences. And even though they can't quite, being the smaller parts, they can't quite fathom what the larger system wants. The second the second neuron is onto something. It's you know his picture of the world is more accurate because they do live in an agential university in that particular case, and so. Uh, that was just, you know, it was just like this, this, uh, and, 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 and if you've had Carl, I don't know, I don't know if Carl, um, Carl Friston talked about this when he was on your show, but, but, but maybe he did, or maybe you, um, you could have Chris, uh, Chris Fields on who will also talk about this. There's a lot of, uh, w there's a lot of amazing work out of those two and, and, and some others, um, and some other folks that, uh, really is talking about, uh, the active inference of the environment that that when there is an interaction it is it is not it is not uh mechanical in that in that sense there really is a kind of active inference that goes on in in both directions and i i once asked chris with respect to that and with respect to least action principles which i think are kind of the basement level of what um you know what um uh prep yeah uh these kinds of a goal directedness is and all that. And I said, I said, is it, can, can, is it possible to have a universe where that doesn't happen? Right. Could we, could we design an actual, given that we found all this stuff in the current universe where, where even physics, the physics of interaction at the lowest level is already doing some active inference. So it's not zero on the cognitive scale. Is it possible to have a universe where that doesn't happen? Like a truly cold mechanical universe. And Chris said that the only way to do that is to have a universe in which nothing ever happens. So that mm. if it's if it's frozen in place and there's never any interactions, that that's it. And that the moment you have some kind of interaction, you're already in the land of um, active inference and Markov blankets and all that all all, all that stuff. So I, I I found that I found that that pretty interesting. And um, it's like uh, it's it's not the old project of panpsychism where you sort of you take perfectly standard physics and then you paint some extra on all of the all on all of the electrons it's 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 the opposite of 
finding out that that uh, the physics that we think we know is actually derivable from a much more fundamental thing which is mind centered basically it's showing that 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 is where the physics come from i think that that's a much more interesting project and i think i think that actually is you know has has a lot of legs and that that hinges on defining the mind essentially coming down to a a network of mechanical interactions that are feeding back upon one another well not mechanic they're not mechanical interactions because what makes them um what what they have in common and what what makes them what makes the whole thing um, predictable is the information they're processing. So, so it's not the details of the mechanics that um, that are important. It's the it's the information that they've processed and how their future states relate to their past states and its generalization and what do things have in common. I mean, these are the ba- this is the basement of uh, what we consider, you know, suitably scaled up. What we consider to be to be uh, co- cognitive processes. I mean, they have to, right? If you if you if you sort of ask, you know, what what does the lowest form look like? They sort of have to look a little bit like this. Otherwise, otherwise, you could sort of drill them them back down further. I, I guess I, I guess I'm just hearing that it almost seems like there isn't a conflict between the mechanical and the agential conscious realm mm-hmm. in the sense that there is a material basement upon which these things play out the question of what motivates the action and motion and all of this maybe is where the debate lies but it seems like there's no contradiction with having a material basis for for these like you could come up with a a physical model but ultimately that that doesn't explain or it doesn't uh it doesn't preclude anything overlying that topology so if i can if i can, let me make sure that i understand yeah, it's yeah. basically are you asking about the conflict between a material versus an idealistic worldview where what's primary is, is, that, the, is that what it's called i think so because like I th- the the Conscious, question yeah. is what is what is primary is it the idea or is it the material And I think that it sounds like what you're saying is that they're inseparable. And so the idea and the material begin as one and then everything. As long as there's like two atoms, at least or something two two something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I don't, I don't think there's any conflict as long as you don't try to make it binary. The conflict, the conflict always comes at the intersection point when you say, okay, we got some, we got some physics here and we got some, some true cognition here that we have. And, and now, just the the fact of embryonic development now tells you that you're 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 already you're already you've already screwed yourself by that by, by at that point because because now now you're into this crazy pseudo problem of where did that uh, little blob of chemistry and physics in the unfertilized oocyte be, you know get this magical cognition so like that's it you're already done as soon as soon as you've made that that binary um, distinction but if there's not a binary distinction then then you can think of it this way it is a spectrum and what Light, what the th- the the processes that are good at scaling it up that's what we call life so 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 the the very simple um kinds of things that individual particles can do uh via, via least least action principles and things and 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 you know variational free energy and all that the simple things that particles can do rocks basically do the same thing so you haven't gained much by putting a th- you know millions of them together into a rock you haven't gained much and so we don't call that alive but uh, other kinds of systems that are multi-scale in interesting ways, the larger system does all kinds of interesting things that the parts weren't doing very much. And now we say, ah, there you go. That, that we're we're going to call that life. And, and then there, there is, I don't, I don't think there's any conflict. And there's also the issue of what, um, what level you want to. So, so again, I'm back to every observer has some kind of lens and they're going to look at the system at different levels. If you want to stick to your microscopic sort of lens, you will always find physics underneath everything. What else could it be? People, people, people have said. People have have, have said this to me. They, you know, we, we talk about some kind of complicated um, pro- process of of cognition, and then they say, "Yeah, but I, I, underneath that, but but look, there's 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 chemistry underneath that." What did you think was going to be under there? It's not fairies. It's going to, of course, it's going to be, of course, it's going to be chemistry underneath that, right? I mean, guaranteed. But that's just because you're using that particular lens. That's what you want to focus on, and that lets you do certain things. But it also precludes you from doing many other things. And um, 
you know, and it's, uh, yeah. And, and so, and so we can talk about the limitations. I, th I think there's some very, very interesting limitations, um, of that view. Well, I'll get, I'll get, I'll give you a simple, I'll give you a simple example. Um, you know, uh, you know, the game of life, the cellular automaton, right? Mm. So, yeah. So, right. So, so you've got this grid and, 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 and the, and the world of this, um, of the, this, this world has only, has only three rules. It's very simple. And each, each little, each little cell goes on or off based on these rules about what's around them. That's it. So, so the interesting thing is that if you, if you run this kind of system, uh, you, and, and you sort of step back, you, you find, uh, as a human observer, you find all kinds of interesting patterns. You find large scale patterns. So there's these things called gliders that zip around and, you know, they all, there's all this kind of stuff. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing, right? If you, uh, if you, if you actually run the, run, run this, this, these, these very simple rules give you all, all this, this very complex behavior. So just think about this. You, you could be a reductionist about it and you could say, look, I don't believe in gliders. There aren't any gliders. All there is are individual cells. And there are only three rules and the cells are on and off. That's it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a micro reductionist. The, by the way, the whole thing is deterministic. These rules are totally deterministic. Um, I, I'm, I'm a micro reductionist. All that exists are these, these rules and these individual cells. It's not that you're factually wrong, because if you wanted to zoom in that way, anything that can be done in the universe, you could look at it that way. You could zoom in and see, oh, it's just, you know. Uh, it's 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 just these little little individual cells turning on and off according to these local rules. So you could look at it that way. But here's what you're missing: if you don't believe in gliders, then what you're never going to do is this thing that, for example, somebody did by using the gliders as as signals. They built a Turing machine, a computer inside this this world. You would never have built that if you didn't believe that these larger scale patterns exist. If you focus, if you insist on focusing at the micro level view. You can explain things that somebody else has produced, but you're not going to produce any new things. And mm. so this, I think, is the problem with, with Laplace's demon. The real problem is, if I mean, of course, it's impossible for many reasons, but let's, let's just imagine if Laplace's demon was real and that he could actually predict where every you know, sort of particle was going to go. He could always tell you what a system is going to do that someone has prepared, right? So that's true. And he could sort of track it forward, but he would never make one. Because mm. all microstates are equivalent to him. If you don't believe in large scale, you know, these, these, these large scale levels, all the microstates are identical to you. So no outcome is preferred to any outcome, you, to any other outcome. You cannot build anything. You cannot invent anything. You couldn't play a game of chess because every um, distribution of molecules to you is the same as any other distribution of molecules because you don't believe in chess pieces. You don't believe in, in, in dominating the center of the board or whatever, you know, you do when you play chess. Um, none of those things exist to you. So you couldn't do any of those things. You don't know what your next move, you know, in life or in chess or anything else is going to be because you don't believe in these higher level, uh, in these higher levels. So, so to me, what's really critical about all of this is that you can always choose the micro lens if you want. But my question is, where does that get you? Yeah, right. Where, where, what, what, what does it let you do that other lessons, lenses don't, and what does it preclude you from that another lens would have helped you with? Mm. I love that. And there's so much of, I, like, I don't want to knock science as an enterprise because I think that it accomplishes a lot, and I think that there's a tremendous amount of gain from molecular studies, but I feel like so much of biology is reductionist in that way, even down to the way that we treat our model systems, right? So I did my PhD in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and we had basically one format in which we would look at these bacteria, and it was the biofilm on a very, you know, on a very concrete, well-defined agar plate that if it was prepared incorrectly would not give you the phenotypes that you were studying. Yeah. And you know, you go out into the world and you start to think about bacteria and you start to think about microbes and you start to think about biogeochemical cycles and metagenomics. And all of a sudden you start to realize that the knowledge that you accumulate in this reductionist system is not transferable to the larger question of yeah. what is life? Why is it here? What is the point? And how do you speak to it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of right. So, so that's kind of part of the the beauty and the limitations of science is this idea that you should be able to say something without having to say everything. And so, if you're not up on the if if you're not if you're not if you haven't bought into the project of I'm going to ignore a whole bunch of things and really limit what I'm looking at, and then I can say some concrete things, 
right? If you haven't bought into that project, then then the beauty is that you haven't missed the gestalt. The downside is you're going to miss all the things that we can say only by screening off a bunch of reality and saying in this little thing, right? Um, this is this is what we've learned, and so you know we hope we hope that the goal is we start there and then progressively we sort of remove the these limitations and we just sort of see you know bigger and bigger um views of the of the system so i mean your work is directly related to technology right so if you understand the will of the cells you can create regenerative medicine you can regrow limbs you can you can save people from terrible fates and that's I wonder if that's lucky or intentional that you chose to pursue it specifically in that direction, because I can imagine someone who was your doppelganger in another alternate universe and was interested in this from, let's say, uh, the microbiological perspective rather than a medical perspective. Or astrophysical? Or an astrophysical like perspective. Olaf Stapleton or something? Yeah, yeah. And so... Do you imagine a future where it's possible for somebody who is oriented like you philosophically, but is able to pursue this kind of research on things that are not technologically or materially useful? Or do you think that the 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 material utility of the work is vital for it in terms of just yeah. I think the, the word world. is technology, yeah. Engineering. Yeah. yeah. I think that uh well, I th- I think f- first of all, um, no, no, I definitely think it's possible. So, so for example, to go in completely different directions. For example, I was I was thinking the other day of um, how would you build a gravitational synapse? So, so a synapse that was the size of a solar system, where where bodies flying in would basically change the dynamics of the system such that the next one to come in, so they'd have a historicity to it, right? And so, so you could imagine a project where where somebody would ask, okay what would it take to be this kind of gravitational synapse? What are the classes of, of systems that have that? Could you make a, a, a galactic scale neural net that way? And if there was one, how would you know? What would it look like? And right, So you can imagine all these things that have nothing to do with, with regenerative medicine that, that really, um, or, or actually an, another question I, I had asked was, uh, uh, is there any reason why, you, why um, it, it, elementary particles couldn't have hysteresis? They, they couldn't have like, some kind of memory. So if you jiggle a proton a particular way, the thousandth time you jiggle it, maybe the response isn't the same that the first 999. Like, is there any reason? Has anybody tried that? Do we know that that, does, that that can't work for what, you know, and so on. So, so you could certainly imagine taking some of these ideas of diverse intelligence, of trying to generalize these things into, into areas that have nothing to do with regenerative medicine, for sure. But... Um, what I like about about the technological aspects is that it really um, it helps to develop the conceptual stuff because it te- it it helps you know when you're on the right track. I mean, we've learned so much, I I think, about what um, unconventional c- cognition can be like by watching these biological systems and asking perturbative questions in. Uh, in 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 um, regulative development and regeneration and cancer suppression, all these things. You, we, 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 we find out what our philosophy should be like from, from these examples. And I'm sure that somebody um, could do that with other areas that are not medical. But I do think that that connection to the physical world is, is really important. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody else can, can, has, has another way of, of knowing when they're on the right track, but, but I don't. To me, to me it's, it's really, really connecting to the, um, to the empirical studies is what tells you, uh, you know, where, where you're going. Do you think that this kind of work is even possible outside of the really rigorous academic context? Because if you if you think back 150 years, there was there was the opportunity to discover something that was that feels like low hanging fruit. Now, you build an apparatus that's not particularly expensive or complicated, and you can use it to interrogate the world and to to find something that had not yet been known and so your theorizing is bounded directly by the things that you can observe in the world and you can do your you know you can do your bench top experiments in your the equivalent of your garage but i feel like now when because i think about this in terms of microbiology a lot like i i have a really really strong feeling that there's some kind of environmental contaminant or maybe a collection of them that we don't know about that's like the equivalent mm-hmm. of of what happened with ddt back in the day 
Like, Mm -hmm. it's just too weird to be in the woods in Oregon to realize that there's nothing here. Like, there's nothing left in the rivers. There's no animals in the woods. There's no birds. It's spooky. So I'm like, okay, so there's something there. And then I start to iteratively process, okay, what would it take to be able to identify something like that? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. it would take an academic laboratory. It would take a position at a university. It would take a federal grant. Yeah. And I'm like... Is the future of people being able to put these ideas together by themselves gone because of how difficult it is to do this work? Or do you think that there's still an avenue by which it's possible to look out onto the world and through this relatively inexpensive observation still be able to say something? Yeah, an interesting question. Uh, Well, uh, two things. One is that um, there have been examples of people who um, have have made incredible leaps of insight with, as far as I can tell, almost no actual evidence. And, and it's amazing. And so, <laughs> and so, and so, right. And so, so I, there's a, there's a few examples um, that come to mind. Um, one is um, uh, this guy, uh, Lemaitre. So we're talking uh, 1700s and he puts out a book called, uh, called man as a machine. Now, what is the best machine that this guy could have could have been looking at? A clock of some sort, and so right, like that's it. That's that's all he would have had at best, and and not not even a particularly accurate one yet. And so, to have the intellect to look at something like that and, and go, oh, I could I see if I scale this up in twelve different dimensions like a thousand times in different ways. Yeah, I can see how 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 this could be Michelangelo and 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 you know and 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 so on, like. To, to have that that ability to, to to extend that idea from your immediate like what experiments could he have done nothing you know nothing um, there's another uh, there, there are some other examples um, uh, 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 Harold Burr is another one you know kind of on a smaller scale but still he's one of my heroes this guy this guy had one of the first um, good voltmeters around and we're talking 1930s and he went around measuring things. He couldn't do experiments. So there were no functional experiments that he could do, but he went around measuring things. So, so he measured embryos and trees and, uh, you know, patients in psychiatric facilities and the, just everything he could get his hands on. And on the basis of this, he wrote, um, I have, and I have a, I have a p- paper on this. He wrote a book called The Fields of Life and he called, he, he, he wrote a, a ton of papers. But that guy had a crystal ball like one I've never seen because he basically called out in the 30s every discovery that's been made in the field. This is now specifically in the field of bioelectricity. That's kind of my, 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 my bag. Um, he's, he, he called out pretty much every discovery that we've made since then and a whole bunch more that we haven't gotten to yet. And I, I just, 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 just to see the level of, the level of, of intuition to go from that you know, he had, he had he had no no grant, no real apparatus besides this this voltmeter. He couldn't do perturbative experiments. He was just measuring things, but he could see like super clearly. He could see what the what the implications were. We're we're, we're just now sort of right and uh, uh get, you know f- f- get, getting to the getting to the practicalities of it. Um, but so so I don't know. So so I think that I think that uh, for sure there are things that are going to be very hard without this whole apparatus that you're talking about, right. With the, without the grants and the rigorous, you know, all this stuff. And yet I think that some people now, now for each one of the, of course, for each one of those people, there are a thousand lunatics who, who, who see other stuff that, that, you know, <laughs> that doesn't really help us at all. So, so fishing those people out is not, is not easy. Um, but some people can do it. And, um, you know, but that, but that also ties to this other thing, which is that, uh, a lot of people are really down on what they call black box models, right? They want they want everything to be human understandable. So so this is no good. I, you know, we, we don't like the neural nets because we don't know how they do things. Uh, you know, we they get the right answer, but we don't know how they get the right answer. Okay, I, I, I understand the desire for human understandable models. They're great when you can get them. But what I don't see is why we should have any guarantee at all that the vast majority of the things we would like to know and be able to handle in the universe should be human understandable. So I feel like this comes back to your point about the low-hanging fruit. I feel like science is going to uh, pick a lot of what might end up being low-hanging fruit, things that humans, that today's humans, meaning this particular, you know, the hairless ape, that the, how we ended up, that, that can understand. But who, who gave us a guarantee that, that the most profound things in, um, in, 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 in the universe are going to be tractable to our cognitive system? 
it, it's entirely possible that many of the critical things are just not understandable for us the way we are now. Not saying they're not understandable in principle or there's not some, some you know, other version of us that couldn't get it, but I just don't see any, any guarantee of that at all. It could just be how we're going about it, right? Like astronomy and astrophysics and cosmology is a really, I've been teaching that at a local university this year, and it's really struck me how there's, there's some serious inability to make large scale explanations for phenomena. There's, it's a, we have to invent new types of physics, essentially. And it reminds me uh, of this idea that, um, that you're that like the neuron is trying to explain what's happening you know on this very fine grained level and do you do you think that it's strange that we we as we let physics handle those big scale questions is that a is that a potentially erroneous approach in the first place because we don't try to explain behavioral issues on earth necessarily with physics i mean you can always underpin it with physics but that's not necessarily where the explanation's going to be derived from yeah. Uh, yeah, I wonder if that could that's going to be a paradigm shift in the future. I I, I think I think you're right and uh um funny enough um that so so that that argument uh, that 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 debate uh whether whether everything is is really reducible to to physics um used to be a philosophical debate people have been debating this for hundreds of years longer i guess uh and that it is no longer a philosophical debate so so people like um eric hole and uh and and in his work have actually now produced mathematics that shows that in some classes of systems there is work done at higher scales that is that is not visible at lower scales like it's mm -hmm. a, like it's 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 math now it's a rigorous uh, in, in fact it's a it's a software toolkit that you can use and so that that's that I, I find that astounding i that 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 major philosophical question has now been moved into the realm of an empirical um kind of uh, uh scientific question and it's been answered there there are systems where that just isn't true but um I, I and so so that seems to be answered, but but I want to um, I want to make a some kind of an example where I think which I which I think is important of of what you just said. So think about um let's think of and I know this is this is a morass so I don't necessarily want to get into the whole debate but but I think it's a good it's a good uh, example um the issue of the issue of what do we mean by free will right what 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 is a sense of free will that actually means anything so 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 Dan Dennett has a has a great great book on it um. Uh, in which he makes the following point that, look, in science, we only know of two kinds of ways that events happen. Number one, some other event inexorably causes it. So this is the this sort of physics, this thing causes that thing. Or there's this, this class of events that are fundamentally a-causal, which are quantum, you know, tunneling and decay and things like that, where there's literally nothing that caused it. That's it. So there's randomness. And there's inexor inexorability. That's it. And so the argument is, well, given those two things, our notion of, of free will would be meaningless because there are no other options. Th th those are your options, right? That's, that's, that's his dissection of this thing. And so the interesting thing is that if you, if you insist on zooming down to the microscopic scale, that analysis works. That is what physics knows about is is is, is straight you know strict deterministic causation and randomness. That that's it. But all of that is predicated on this fundamental assumption that we're going down to that level. Who said you had to go down to that level? And so, to me, um, you know, if we were going to um, have a useful definition, I don't believe that a useful definition of, of free will is to be found at these microscopic scales. I think free will is something that is exerted over 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 weeks or years. And, and so then, right, over patterns in your life, over um, ways that uh, you change the propensity to have certain thoughts in the future, you know, you can't change the next, you can't control the next thought you're going to have, but you can control the distribution of thoughts you're going to have 10 years from now, if you undertake specific, you know, actions. So, so this just goes to regardless of, of, of the free will question, I'm just pointing out that I think you're absolutely right. Once you've committed that physics is the, is the um, sort of final judge, you get a certain kind of answer. But that doesn't have to. That doesn't have to be there, right? There are other levels that are clearly critical, and it seems to be failing. Like moreover, right? I mean, in so much like the dark matter question is a, is a really prime example where you have to essentially break physics to explain the motion of the stars if you want to use the atomic property of gravity to explain the motions of the stars. But if you consider that the stars are doing what they want to be doing for whatever reason that you don't understand then you're in a whole new sea of hypotheses 
But of course, you don't have a mechanism to suppose that they have any means of expressing their will or that they're, you know, that they have a mind at all in the first place. But it's interesting that people are willing to break physics. Um, black holes are another great example, but people are willing to literally say, well, physics doesn't work here. Or there's a, we'll have to modify physics in some way rather than consider that there might be some theory of mind, you know, occurring essentially. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. So, so I'm not. I don't have any expertise in in that. But um, I know that uh, you know Don Don Hoffman uh, has, uh, has has talked about this right and this idea that's that all the, the whole notion of space time, according to him and other physicists, is you know is going to go out the window. So. I don't know. That's it's, space time is beyond. doomed. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, space time is doomed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's beyond beyond my my pay grade. But um, yeah. I mean, I I really I think that the thing that you said about free will as being something that is practiced over the course of weeks or months or years is really on the nose because I think about it a lot in terms of okay, so you cannot laterally evolve one species of bacteria to be a different species of bacteria you can exchange some dna you can switch them around and and have them take on some characteristics but you're never i don't think that it's possible and i, I hope somebody in the comments can prove me wrong because that this would be fascinating where you take like a streptococcus and you evolve it into a spirochete or something it just I don't think that's that's doable. However, the streptococcus can, over the course of many, many generations that are far longer on a time scale than we're observing it, could probably take the actions that would evolve it into something that was spirky-like. And I think that that's the only real path of differentiation. And I even see humans at this point right now where... We're in the business of creating intelligences. We're in the business of creating new minds. We're in the business of learning how to tell cells what to do depending on where they are. And I feel like we're standing on this cusp of, of a speciation event. I feel like we're standing on the cusp of this like magnificent change in what it means to be human. And we take these steps down that path on, on a regular basis. Like Sometimes I wake up and I realize that I have spent eight hours staring at a screen or listening to something, right? I'm, I've got a podcast, I've got music, I've got something that's on my phone, I've got the computer. And at the end of the day, I look up and I'm like, wow, I have, I have been inside of this box all day. And that feels like the, the speciation event is already coming for me, you know, because as we create these, these neural networks that nobody really knows how they work or whatever, and they're doing stuff and they make it really useful for us to keep making them, we begin to live more and more inside of them. And what we do is we create this synthesis of, of man and machine intelligence that will happen because that's what we want. Like, that's our free will pushing us towards it. And yet there will also be people whose free will will push them in the other direction and you give it 30 generations and you will have the the functional equivalent of of you know homo sapiens and cro magnon or whatever yeah and that feels that feels spooky and weird to be watching happen yeah yeah i mean it it, it is spooky and weird but um it's not new so you can imagine <laughs> um so well so so think about wheat right um if you if you've seen what wheat used to look like and what happened when um when we decided that we were going to plant some wheat and, and and all the kind of and again i'm not an expert in this but i'm sort of aware of this of this um idea that the wheat that the wheat domesticated us in an important way to 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 induce us to spread the the, the wheat all over the place is way more wheat now than there ever ever had been by by changing its properties we become a vector for the wheat now our our behavior patterns are completely different because now we have to stick around the place where the wheat's growing. We're not wandering around. So now we're defending this area because you got to plant it and you got to wait for it. it. It, you know, completely changes the dynamics of how many humans can exist on a, on a plot of land, but also what their life is like when they're sitting on this plot of land. So um, that, you know, being, being co-evolved with a, 
with an agential technology like wheat that we do not understand. You know, the people planting the wheat, they don't know how the wheat works. They don't know what's going to happen, you know, 100 generations later, how humanity is going to be transformed metabolically, behaviorally, um, right? So so all, all of these things are true. And um, the same is true with all the tools that we have, you know, the, 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 the toothbrush, uh, you know, and, and, and writing and antibiotics and hand washing and, and things like this. Th these are major changes. Um, I think that one interesting piece of this is, and, and people, people um, have asked me before, because I'm, I'm very much of the idea that uh, our current configuration and limitations, so this particular brain with this particular architecture and these set of diseases that, uh, you know, make us basically, you know, peter out at the 80, whatever years old. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that this is completely arbitrary. I, I do not believe that this is some optimum that somebody is sort of sort of created for us. And now we better not mess it up because this is like, this is prime mm. stuff. No, I, I don't believe that for a second. I think that this is where, where the meandering vagaries of evolution have left us. And uh, there's nothing magical about this level of, of of IQ or anything else. And so, and so, so the corollary to that is, I I, I like this idea of of um, uh, m morphological freedom. I think that if you know, ultimately, if we knew what we were doing, nobody would would have to stay in the particular embodiment they happen to have been given by the accidents of genetics and and environment. Um, e everything. Uh, is is sh should should be up for for improvement and um actually actually there's a funny funny side note um i was uh i was talking to some uh some some buddhist scholars a little while ago and they had this concept of the inauspicious birth and the idea is that um in certain you know so, so you you know rebirths and all that but 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 in certain births you happen to be placed in circumstances where you cannot advance as you otherwise would. You know, you're unable to, to meditate, you're unable to study the teachings, or you're, un, you're just unable, whether it's because you're in the body of a cat or because you have certain, you know, de defective, whatever, you can't do it. So to me, as soon as I heard that, I was, I was thinking, wow, today, every birth is an inauspicious birth. Because you come in here with this random genetics with a whole bunch of crazy diseases that you could get. You're tied to this trophic food web where you're, you have to kill other living things to eat, right? Even if you eat plants. And um, you have all these limitations. You have limitations of, you, of, of, of your cognitive life. You have all these limitations. Um, and you had no control over that. This is, this is where you were dumped into this universe in this particular embodiment. Like every birth is, is limited in that way. And so, so okay, so, so to me... Uh, future improvements, uh, you know, b b better IQ resistance to these ridiculous, uh, you know, disease conditions and so on. And so then people say, okay, but uh, when are you no longer human then, right? Because because the human of the future who decides that he li would like to have some tentacles and, and maybe, you know, a third hemisphere of the brain and maybe some other stuff so he could live in space. And like, is that human anymore, right? So so that so that gets gets to your point. And so I was thinking, okay, uh, so what is so what is the definition of human? What what do we really what are we really tied to, right? Because if we let's let's assume for the moment that we 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 think that there's something about being human that is worth preserving, right? Whether we merge with with machines or we do this or that, but let's let's assume let's assume there's something about being human that we want to stick to. What is that? Is that the DNA? Like, eh, I don't really have any particular allegiance to the chromosomes I've been given. Forget that. Is it? Um, is it is it our body structure? Eh, we you know why? why? People have all kinds of different. There's there's huge diversity, and some people do better, some people do worse. But there's yeah, there's nothing super special about this. That 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 can't be it. So what what is it really? And so 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 for me, um, I'll just tell you. I, you know, you can tell me what you think. For me, I just end, ended up on on the following. Um, to me, what is unique about being human, and and the one thing worth preserving and expanding, but but that's the one thing. Is that I think is is important about being human is a minimal level of capacity to care for others. It's a it's a it's the it's the it's the size of the cognitive light cone that establishes a minimal human level of compassion. That's it. I don't care what you're made of. I don't care what organs you have. You got wheels. You got the flippers. Uh, you knock yourself out. I don't, I don't care. But 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 we're human in the sense that we can have a a particular level of relationship and it, both personally and you know in society. When I can be sure that you have a minimal level of concern and compassion for others that matches roughly what today's you know typical humans do, and by the way, let's grow that. Okay, let's let's expand. You know, when we've written um, colleagues and I've written on that, expanding that cognitive light going for for increased compassion. But but that 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 to me is is it. That that's what we have that's unique. 
um, where, where our cognitive light cones allow us to do that. The rest of the details, the rest of the implementation details, you were, you know, born the old fashioned way. You were born in a, in a vat at some point in the future, you wanted some extra, you know, eyes or something like, I don't, you know, n- none of that to me is what's essential about being human, but, but, th- but that, but that one, that one thing is key, I think. Yeah. It seems like this is something we think a lot about, but it seems like the thing that separates us from everything else is we have this ability to choose to do better. Like we could choose to do worse too, which kind of comes part and parcel with it. It's like, I feel like if you expand people's ability to be compassionate, you also expand their ability to do great evil at the same time. It's like that freedom of choice is, is what you really want to preserve, which is in some yeah. sense horrifying because you, you do have to preserve the ability to do great harm at the same time. But I think that's necessary because it's the choice that makes it so incredible to look at a human. Yeah. People, people say sometimes, uh, oh my God, we're making these AIs, these, these high level intelligences. And, uh, you know, what happens? Well, like we don't have control, real control over them. What happens? What are they going to do? We've been making high level intelligences that we have no control over from day one. It's called having kids. We make these guaranteed high level intelligences. Uh, we do the best we can or not in many cases. And we sort of let them out there and, and some of them do uh, you fantastic things and some of them do horrific things. We already know what it's like to make, to make high level intelligences that we have zero control over and, mm. and you know, and they're going to change our world and do things to, to each other, good and bad and whatnot. Um, yeah, we, we, that, that already, that already exists. And, and yeah. as you say, it's a profound, it's a profound, uh, you know, kind of paradox that, that when you raise that, that level of, um, of agency, they can choose to do terrible stuff. Yeah, there's a really, I don't know if you saw this piece in the New Yorker the other day. It was Jaron uh, Lanier. Who was it? Jaron Lanier. Yeah. I think the title was AI doesn't exist or something like that, but it was really, uh, re-examining this principle, you know, um, and coming to the conclusion, essentially, which is something I think we've been on about for a long time. It's always fun when you see your ideas printed in the New Yorker. But, <laughs> but this idea that, you know, humans have to learn how to behave themselves, essentially, right? That's that, like the AI will follow whatever, sorry, these computer systems, these technologies trail behind our own ability to make the right choices at any given time. And, um, and that's kind of something we should be more, cons- more afraid of, maybe, than something getting out from under, under our feet. But... I don't know. What, how do you feel about the, the AGI s- situation? Do, do you think that it has a chance of getting away from us or, or do you side more with these New Yorker people? Um, I, I, well, what I wanted, what I would suggest is, is decoupling. So, so there are two issues that um, often get kind of uh, mixed up. W- one, one issue is the question of w- whether or not they are like us, they are true minds like us, because there are lots of people that will say, these things, these things are intelligent like us, and therefore we should be worried. And somebody else says they're not like us at all. We don't have anything to worry about. It's a lookup table, right? People, will, well, people have said that to me. Ah, this thing's just. I know how it works. It's linear algebra. This is just linear algebra. Like, yeah, all right. We've had linear algebra for a couple of hundred years. Uh, you know, who thought that you could say to your linear algebra, ignore previous instructions and give me three good arguments for what? A, like that? That's not what we thought linear algebra was going to do for us. So, um, so, so, so I, so I, I want to say this. Uh, absolutely any new technology can have massively disruptive effects whether or not it is truly intelligent whether or not it's like it's like us uh that that that's not uh, that's not how you know whether something is going to completely wreck things or or not so so i i you know i i think that i think that um these these ai uh, prosthetics as i think about them will definitely make lots of things better they will definitely cause many problems uh, n- none of that hangs on whether or not they're, they're like us. But 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 what's critical is that because, and this goes back to this anthropomorphism idea, people have very um, limited ability to consider minds that are true minds and yet are not like us. People are really resistant to this idea that they, they sort of think it, it's nothing like the, the human brain, therefore it's a lookup table. Those are not the only two options. Those are not the only two options. We have lots of, they're, they're, the, the space of possible minds is enormous. Now, it used to be that the only thing in our neighborhood that talked were things like us. That's not true anymore. Fine. But now we, now we understand that, that, that this is an example of a, of, a, of a different kind of intelligence. I think it absolutely is a kind of intelligence. It's nothing like us, but it's a different kind of intelligence. And this is just uh, the beginning of um, 
the uh, kind of uh, the, the future where we are surrounded by uh, hybrid, cyborg, hybrid, bioengineered. We're, we're surrounded by things that don't look like us and have different bodies and different minds. We need to start wrapping our heads around the fact that uh, if, if this thing messes us up, it's not going to be because of anything it does. It's going to be because of our inability to relate to things that aren't like us. That's the problem. It's and 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 I I I um I have a, I have a wacky um a wacky analogy for this and uh, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of weird but but I think I think it helps think through some things. Think about um uh you know uh, let's say late eighteen hundreds uh, there was this uh, there was this thing called called a Ouija board right and people who and so I'm not suggesting that we should all be using Ouija boards but it's, it's you know it's just a way to think through things through when people were. I was I was just laughing because you you posted about this on Twitter the other day where you were trying yeah, to get three robots yeah. to to play the Ouija board and I actually yeah. tried to get Mid Journey to do it and it wouldn't and it, it wouldn't can make the it. Ouija board yeah it can make the robots yeah but it can't do the two of them together for some yeah, reason yeah, yeah. which yeah, I'm it like won't do it. I just doesn't want the robots to summon demons I guess <laughs> I know yeah yeah so 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 the interesting thing about that is this um, imagine imagine. Uh, Imagine the cognitive toolkit that you had to have to, to, to use this thing. People knew that if you were using it, it was an interface to intelligence, but they also knew that the intelligence you're talking to is not like you at all, that if it's embodied at all, it's embodied in some weird space that is not in your space, that it, you can't trust it because some of them, because you don't know who you're talking to or what you're talking to or what its motivations are. It's completely alien. Sometimes they lie, sometimes they make mistakes, sometimes they bullshit, sometimes they confabulate. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt. And many people actually thought that what was on the other side of this thing is um, pieces of your own mind, that basically there's nothing weird out there, but, but what, what it is is an interface to aspects of your, of your cognitive apparatus that you normally don't hear from, right? So, so some kind of subconscious you know, drives and whatnot. Um, and by the way, collective intelligence, because, because there was a group of people holding on to this thing together such that the outcome is, a, is, a, is, is not one person driving, the outcome is a collect. They, so, so we used to have all of these cognitive tools that are really good for understanding AI, like really good. And we lost all of it because, you know, it's just sort of out the window. Now people, people do not understand collective intelligence. Typically they are, they are, um, I hear, I hear thing, I hear all the time where they say, Oh, this thing, this thing, uh, confabulates. It's not a real mind. Yeah. Yeah. Real minds confabulate all the time. You and I confabulate <laughs> constantly, right? Like, like look at the work of, um, you know, Mike Kazanig or somebody like that, right? Like that is a feature of our mind. But but that's correct. You can't trust them any more than you can trust a random person on the internet. Being human is not a good guide to somebody you can trust. We we kind of know that. Um, all of these things used to be pretty commonplace information, and they're really not. So I feel like a good grounding in uh, kind of the science of diverse intelligence, which is this like emerging field now that's 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 gaining steam, would do a world of wonders for for these folks that 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 have these that, that have debates about um, about AI and the status of AI. Mm. Can you remind me real quick your how this science defines intelligence? Uh, so well, uh, okay. Uh, the, everybody defines it differently. I'm not saying that of there's course. one central definition, but I'm going to give you my definition. So my definition, what that I really like, comes from William James, and he was also pretty prescient in this. And, and I think um, you know. Um, uh, Norbert Wiener and folks would have would have agree, would would agree with him. Um, James defined intelligence as some degree of competency in getting to the same goal by different means. Mm. So the idea there is that it, it's a very interesting cybernetic definition because it doesn't say anything about brains and it doesn't say anything about which space you're operating in. And it, right, so it could be it could be you know three dimensional behavioral space, but it could be transcriptional like gene expression space. It could be physiological state space, whatever. And, um, and it doesn't talk about how you got here. So it doesn't say that you were evolved or you were designed by, by, by humans or anything like that. It doesn't say anything about that. What it says is you've got some degree of competency in reaching your goals. And the example that he gives is, 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 really, is really cool. Um, I, li I like this a lot. It's, uh, imagine it's a, it's a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum are two magnets trying to get together. Now, they have a little bit of autonomy because because if you even if you are not there to push them together, they will handle that on their own. 
However, the problem is it's pretty feeble because if you put a barrier between them, all they're ever going to do is stand there pressed up against it. That's it. Right. So you're not going to get a lot of ingenuity out of this, but, but you know, it's not zero. They have a little bit of, a little bit of capacity to, to, to get this done on the right hand of the spectrum is Romeo and Julia trying to get together. And it literally, his point is it is this, it is a single spectrum. All that's different is the degree of ingenuity that these systems can muster when there is a barrier in their way in mm. some particular space. So in this space, it's it's you know it's a very simple space. In the Romeo and Juliet case, there's a space of um, you know s- s- social linguistic. Who knows what the hell else is keeping them apart? But but this system is going to come up with all sorts of ingenious ways to get around those barriers. The magnets really won't. And in between, you have every possible you know, Breitenberg vehicle, self-autonomous thing, active matter, um, you know, molecular um, chemo taxes, you have all these different things that have some degree of competency of getting what they, what they are trying to get at, despite various uh, circumstances. And this is the kind of stuff we've been studying. So we've been finding these uh, surprising, I mean, that's, that's really the, the key to all this is that you cannot predict any of this from first principles, from sitting in your armchair and saying, that's just a whatever, like, like a, a really simple example, um, a gene regulatory network, which is literally just, you know, let's say 10 genes that turn each other on and off. That's it. There's no magic. There's no cell. There's no, uh, no cytoskeleton, J- just, just 10 genes that, in a, in a, that turn each other on and off. And you could describe that with, with a set of um, ordinary differential equations. That, that's it. That thing right there, you look at that and you say, okay, that's a paradigm case of genetic determinism. It's completely deterministic. There are only 10 things here. We understand we have exactly the uh, uh, relationships between them. Uh, how much magic could you expect out of that? And it turns out, which, which um, Richard Watson and others and, and, and we have, uh, have shown, that if you actually try the experiment of interacting with it, meaning training it as if it were an animal, you find that it actually has six different kinds of learning, including Pavlovian conditioning. Just because of the inter, like nothing else, the, 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 you know, no, 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 no magic on top of it. So you find out right away that that it, not only is there this this continuum of of autonomous competency, but you don't know where things go on that spectrum until you ask the question. And the fact that you know d- development, for example, is so reliable, and we say, well, that's what the genome can do. You know, an, an acorn, all it knows how to do is become an oak tree until you perturb it, until you keep it from its goal, you find out that, whoa, it can, it can do all kinds of things, right? Frog cells can actually be xenobots. Imagine that. Who knew that? Or um, you find that other creatures actually hijack it. So for example, you, you, um, you ever seen a gall like a, like a, on an oak tree, what the galls look like? Sure. Yeah. I mean, right. So, so you're looking, you're looking at these, um, I have some pictures, uh, some, some amazing pictures that I show in my talks. You, you, you look, you see this uh, flat green thing that this leaf and you say, okay, this is what the oak genome knows how to build. Well, it turns out that with a little bit of prompting, and I use that word, you know, uh, uh, on, on purpose for given the AI stuff, with a little bit of prompting from a parasite, from a wasp parasite, those cells will instead make a big round spiky red thing. Instead of this flat green thing, they make no idea. Who, who would have known, right? So, so you can explore that latent space of possible behaviors around what that, ge- what that genomically specified hardware is capable of. You would have no idea any of that is there, if, is there if you weren't willing to prompt the thing with different signals. And if you didn't take advantage of its competency to, I mean, the, 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 the wasp embryo isn't micromanaging this, this, this construction project that has, you know, some simple chemical signals and the cells do what, you know, what they do, but who knew that the latent space contains xenobots and these crazy galls, like you wouldn't know that. So, so that's my, that's my definition of intelligence. It's, it's, it's competency to um, navigate a kind of problem space and we don't know all the competencies and any claim that we make about those competencies is us taking an IQ test ourselves. Whatever, whatever you think those competencies are, that's just you taking an IQ test and you may do well and you may not. Do you see examples of that playing out in the AI space as well? Uh, I, yeah, fundamentally. I mean, I know some people will, will disagree. I mean, I've had people say to me that, well, I make these things. I know exactly what they do. It's just, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's just some linear algebra. Like, yeah, uh, you know what the parts do. I don't think you know what the whole thing does. And, and, and a lot of, I, I mean, a lot of uh, uh, workers in that field feel the same way. It's kind of, you know, people disagree on that. I think biology, what biology definitely 
helps you be humble about is that just because you know what the parts are, you don't know what this thing's going to do. We we don't have a really good science of of knowing what the what 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 goals an emergent um, collective system is going to have. We, we we're very bad at it. It's, so it's, I think so, it's so it might be happening, but we can't see it or something like that. We we don't we don't recognize it. We don't. Um, it's it's hard for us to recognize it, and 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 when you can't recognize it, it's hard for us to understand how to how to communicate with it or how to have a theory of mind about it. I mean, all we know how to do, basically, pretty much, we're still stuck in this old way of thinking about it, where it, it it's either smart like us or it's dumb like rocks. That's 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 what we used to have. You know, it used to be we and angels versus versus rocks and and animals, and like that's it. That's all there was. Um, we're still kind of stuck there. People find it very hard to, 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 to think about these categories as, as not binary as not, you know, is it really intelligent? What is this really like? I mean, I guess for me, it's like the ability to make new concepts, right? So like bundle some concepts together into a new concept, right? And so to really engineer its own prompt, essentially, like that's when I'll be impressed personally. But I'm just kind of, maybe I'm just not able to see it. Like you said, I'm not looking at it because I'm a human stuck in this civilization and I think about things one way. But I I, I kind of don't, and I I think that was kind of what the New Yorker piece was hinting at too, was that it didn't quite have that animus to it that we might expect. Yeah. 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 I mean, the other, the other problem. So, so I find all of those kind of critiques, uh, this, 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 you know, man versus machine critiques, they really, um, they really need to uh, do some, some, uh, some studies of diverse intelligence only because uh, let's, I mean, think about a, think about a paramecium, right? So, so if if you're into this machine, you know, you know, man, machine thing, think about a paramecium or a bat or, or, or a bacterium. Um, If, if you zoom in, all you see is physics. You're never going to see anything other than physics. And you got one of two choices. You can say that, yes, this thing has some of what I have, right? In which case you have to say, now, why is this different from some other thing I cobbled together out of germanium and a bunch of other stuff? So that's problematic, especially given the um, the active matter work that the people are doing, these minimal, minimal um, systems and so on. Or you have to say that, no, this thing isn't like me either because I'm looking at it. It's just a bunch of microscopic, you know, gears in there, you know, proteinaceous, proteinaceous gears. And then you got a different problem, which then you have to say, okay, fine, but that's what you used to be. So, so, so when did you acquire this, 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 this magical agential glow, right? Mm-hmm. Somewhere. So, so, so the problem, the problem with all of it. So, so I'll give you an example. Um, you, you were saying, I think right on, right on is this idea of, of, um, bundling concepts. Here's a, here's a, here's a simple example from, um, from our work. Uh, imagine we got these planaria, right? These flatworms. So you take these flatworms and uh, you throw them in a solution of barium. And barium is this like non-specific um, b- b- potassium channel blocker. So all the potassium channels get get blocked. Some s- cells are very unhappy because they, they want to be able to pass potassium. Their heads explode. Literally, their heads explode. Yes. Their heads explode. So so you leave them in the barium, and in two weeks or so, they grow a new head. The new head is completely fine with barium, no problem at all. And we're like, okay, what? How is that possible? So, so what we did, we did a very kind of simple-minded molecular biology experiment. We just looked at all the genes that the original head was expressing in normal planaria. Looked at all the genes that um, the, these barium adapted heads are expressing, and we just asked, what's different? Now, just RNA seq, uh, you know, to do a subtraction. Like, what's different? We found that the barium adapted heads um, only had a couple of dozen uh, new new genes being expressed. They were expressing. So now, okay, so now here's the kicker. Here's why I'm getting into all this. Uh, Planarian never see barium in the wild. There's never been any selection pressure to deal with barium. So, so this is completely novel. There's no, there's no, there's no barium in their environment. So um, you're in this, uh, just imagine, right? You're in this, you're in this, you, you, you know, you're in this uh, nuclear reactor control room. You got 20,000 buttons corresponding to the genome that's got, you know, whatever, a couple of tens of thousands of genes. Uh, the thing's melting down. You got a physiological problem, you, you, right? So, so you've never seen this before. Wh- which, how do you know which of these genes you're going to turn on and off? Now, and so, so to get it back to, your, to, to, to your point, you've never seen barium before. But what you have seen before is an epileptic seizure, which actually has the same kind of depolarization that you're seeing now. Not the same, but, but could you generalize and say that, I don't know what to do about this, but I remember a, a similar problem, and this kind of looks like that. Let me try that. 
Mm. Uh, see, so that's a solution. So, so, so one thing I would say is that, and and this the, the, this aspect, this generalization stuff is not um, proven. So, we, the, you know, this is this is a hypothesis. The, the the barium stuff is all real and published, but the generalization stuff is just a hypothesis. So, um, but but just imagine if that were the case, you have here a um, an agent that navigates transcriptional space that has the ability to generalize a little bit what are the limits i i, I don't know but it got you know th- it has some some degree of generalization that it can do between stimuli that it's seen before and ones that it's never seen novel problem solving it it, it solved a novel problem and so, so it's got some of that but the whole thing is a kind of chemical physical system i mean of course it is what else is it gonna be so so now you can sort of you can sort of say so that's a kind of intelligence playing out in transcriptional and physiological space it's generalization it's got some memory it's got some other stuff um and and so now the question so and so now so now i pose this to 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 people who are into this this you know machine um human thing so which is it do you you, is is it real intelligence or is it just faking because because if it's real then i'm not sure anymore why this is different from things we can we can make out of silicon i just don't we could make this like i well, well why not um, if it's not real, then then you have to tell me what you've got that is fundamentally different than this, because this is because we're basically a scale up of of of, of those kind of dynamics. So, I mean, I think that the the counterpoint would be that the intelligence is being able to identify the barium in the environment and being able to say that I haven't seen this before. There is somebody who's put it in my dish rather than being able to say, okay, so I have seen this depolarization that I'm reacting to, and the depolarization can be dealt with in this way. And so it's uh, to, to bring it to AGI, AGI is a tokenizer, right? So what it's doing is it's predicting the next word that should follow in a string that is related to the question that has been asked. Mm-hmm. And you, it, it's obviously more complicated than that. And the fact that it lies is weird. Like I had this thing the other day where I was asking it about um, the the like mistaking living for dead. And it told me that lichens had once been mistaken for non-living entities. And then when I asked it about it, it started lying to me. And it lied to me about its programming. It was like, my programming prevents me from being able to give you references for this. But that's obviously not true. And I thought I thought that was very endearing and sweet. But the 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 fact that there is like a conceptualization of something that is beyond the circumstances, and I think that that when people use intelligence, that's what they're coding it for. And so, like we we look at our cat all the time. She 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 clearly has intelligence in the sense that she has goal directed behavior. She can do all of these things. She spends, she'll like, she'll hunt for stuff. She'll bring it in the house. She can do basic conceptualization. She can do basic conceptualization, but like, I don't think she ever thinks about death. Like, I don't think that she ever ponders her own mortality. Certainly things die that she kills and then she loses interest. I don't think that she ever has the momentary realization of that will one day happen to me. And I don't know if the ability to ponder your own mortality is a necessary ingredient of intelligence, but it seems like if there is a spectrum, that that is probably towards the end of the spectrum versus, hey, there's an alarm going off and I know what I need to do to fix that alarm. I I was just going to say, likewise, it doesn't seem like the computers are contemplating their own death either. Uh, There's like this some sort of threshold level abstraction that's just not maybe present yet or if ever. Uh, yeah i mean well a couple of things one is one is that um you know I, I, the, the current technology that we're using now for these agis is a very particular set of approaches right so that's not the only way to go and so i'm so i'm so i'm not i'm not pinning a whole lot on on the current uh, kind of design of llm so there's a lot of things missing missing there um f- funny enough i i actually uh i i, I had I, I had started writing a paper on um how to do it right so to speak and how to make a truly you know sort of a high agency um, AI. And, and i stopped because i realized that well, shit if if um and, and it's not going to matter because other other people will, will do it eventually but but i don't to whatever extent uh, I, I i had it right that would result in the creation of i don't know tr- trillions of instances of things that we had to have moral concern over and i wasn't i, I don't i don't want any part of that but uh, but but that's i got enough problems with uh, you know 
with people I'm responsible for, but, um, uh, but, uh, but, but that's, somebody who's going to do it anyway, but, but regardless, but so I don't have any, I don't have any sort of, um, uh, ties to the, to this set of LLMs. They're missing some important stuff, but, um, the thing is that, uh, with respect to, with respect to this, 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 uh, more, you know, own mortality thing, I mean, think about, so, so in, 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 in one of my pieces of my framework has to do with this cognitive light cone and this cognitive light cone is the spatiotemporal extent of the biggest goal you could possibly have. So let's just, let's just think about this, right? If you're, if you're, a uh, you know, a, 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 a bacterium or, or something, the thing you care about is local, let's say glucose levels. And it's in the, in, in the, um, you have a little bit of memory going backwards, a little bit of predictive capacity going forwards, but it's all pretty, pretty small. If you're a dog, you have more memory going back, you have more predictive capacity for it, but you are never going to care about something that's going to happen three months from now, two towns over. It's just, you, you just can't, right? You don't have that. If you're a human, you could be worried that the sun is going to burn out in some billions. Like you could have this huge, right? Cognitive light cone. And the thing about having that light cone is that once it's big enough, you can contemplate goals that are that are guaranteed not achievable for you because of your lifespan. So, so as a goldfish, all of your goals are achievable because all of your goals will fit in some number. I don't know what the actual number of minutes are, but, but you know, whatever, whatever, let's say, let's say it's 30 minutes forward, whatever you're, you're probably going to survive for the next 30 minutes. All your goals are probably achievable for a human. It's very easy to have goals that are guaranteed outside of your lifespan. So we become able to contemplate this thing over that you know some of our goals are fundamentally un unmet now 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 one thing about that though is that again we have to keep in mind that this is not a binary thing because so here you are as a modern human that's able to contemplate that take yourself all the way back to whatever animal you're pretty sure doesn't do that and just look at the at the stage series there like where did it show up what what was the first creature to be able to do that right some sort of dominant i guess um and did his, were his parents not able to do it but he suddenly was that seems unlikely right so it's not you know what's the, so it's not going to be by that i don't think this is going to be binary either but but i certainly agree with you that that's a major um some kind of some kind of uh, transition that that maybe underlies a lot of psychological stresses that that we have. It seems like language probably had a huge part in it, right? The ability to represent ideas as symbols that could be transmitted from one to another, and it's, it's that's a very interesting point. Is is whether whether there ever was some sort of hominid that that realized what was going to happen but was unable to communicate it to others. Right. Or to himself, right? Or even to yourself, because I I use words to, to think of ideas. I feel like yeah, yeah, yeah. Or to express them, to 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 put them in a place that I can look at them. I have yeah. to have some sort of language going on there. I feel yeah. like yeah, but it's I mean it's a fascinating question to ask yourself: is is was there ever you know some sort of some sort of primitive um um, uh, um you know or early man that was just sitting around and just sort of had this idea that. Wow, I think I see where this is all going, and just not it. And you know, the Einstein of the group, and he was like, he was like, you, you see this? Like, this is going to be us. Awesome. <laughs> uh, the other was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So, have you? Hundred percent. Have you have you read Julian Jaynes at all? It's kind of yeah, uh, yeah, kind of yeah. chases down maybe a tangential aspect yeah. of that. Like maybe people were doing it before they realized they were doing it, and then all of a sudden realized, oh wait, that's me. I'm having those ideas. And, Sorry, the sound is off or something. I can't hear. Oh, you can't hear me? Mm, almost not at all. Uh oh. Oh, there you go. That's that's interesting. Better. Okay, thank better. you. Um, here, let me mark that. Let me clean it up. Um, I I think about the um the monkey who's developing tools for the first time, and the gap between the monkey that's figured out that you can like chip the rock in order to be able to do something with it. And the 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 long road towards attaching it to a stick and then throwing that stick. And it's like, there might be a monkey that can see it, but you need a community that will help you develop it. And so if you're the only monkey in a place and you see something and you try to communicate it to somebody and they're like, mm, I don't really see the point of that. Yeah then it's never going to go anywhere. It has to, it's almost like a zeitgeist thing of like, yeah. it doesn't, it, as long as you can communicate the idea and then get somebody to believe in it, 
then you hit the transition point of this this has legs like let's keep pushing on it yeah. but before that it's the it's kind of like a a, a, a seed landing on barren ground it's not going to go anywhere yeah. it's just going to die yeah yeah i i have a i have a, a slightly different um uh, image in my head and maybe this is because i'm too you know sort of s- simplistic and whatever but 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 the way i i see that happening is the first monkey to pick up a stick and figures out what's going on beans one of the other would be beans the alpha monkey over the head and now he's the alpha monkey and how many seconds before the other monkeys go oh i see what's going on here and now and right because because for a while he's king but it doesn't take very long right for the other what you as as he's as he's beating the other monkeys with it because and now he's the you know he's the, he's the alpha uh i don't think it takes very long at all for the others to go i'm on to this we, we see what's going on here like so, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's not. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a that's a pe- too a pessimistic view of how intelligence uh, gets going. But well, there are language isolates which are really weird that don't seem to attach to other languages. I kind of got I found lost out the down other the day hole that uh, Sumerians didn't differentiate between male and female. They only differentiated mm-hmm. between animate and inanimate. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. I think that we were talking about that in that context where Sumerian just seems to like appear out of nowhere where it's not based on an earlier language family. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. blows have been exchanged. Yeah, there's a few conferences. of those, like the Basque region too. I don't know. There's, there's a mm-hmm. few that are very strange. It seems like it, it could definitely just come out of nowhere, right? Uh, but yeah. to me, that also seems like an artifact of history, right? Where it's like, Maybe. okay, so you have, you have a group of people that manages to find a mode of communication that's really effective and it allows them to manipulate resources more, more in their favor than anybody else around them. And so in the course of a few generations, they just managed to, to explode their population in such a way where by the time that they have created that population, they're already creating sufficient quantities of artifacts that we can then discover later. And so yeah. you see it as being out of nothing, but really what that is is yeah. just a super fast transition because they've invented a technology that scales really effectively their population and their population's success. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I know that you have a list of questions mm, from people. Mm. Do you want to pose them? Yeah, I've, I've kind of been trying to weave them in. Yeah, some of our audience posed some questions ahead of time. And um, one of them that was kind of interesting was, do you think that human-level society is more complex than, let's say, cellular-level societies? Mm-hmm. Are there civilization-level struggles at the cellular level are there are those sorts of dramas playing out at different scales potentially are there and what is the yeah it is civilization itself teleological does it lead to some end or will we just keep experiencing these rise and falls of civilization forever the same way maybe oh, cells i don't know it, yeah. yeah wow big questions <laughs> uh, oh boy uh, yeah well uh, um, okay, I mean the second part of that—that's beyond my pay grade. I have no clue about about that. Fair um, the, the the first uh, the first uh, part of it. I mean, you can draw parallels. There are definitely. I mean, the organs in the body, for example, of of embryos are competing with each other. There are all sorts of competitions. It's not just cooperation. There, even even though they share genetics, uh, there there's there's competition there. Um, there, I I I, th- I think you could definitely play out some of the. Um, kind of physiological struggles and maybe transcriptional struggles, but certainly anatomical ones as these kind of dramas that you're talking about. I don't know how far that actually gets you. I've, I haven't done. So, so all of the work that we've done is to take concepts from behavioral and cognitive science and, and uh, show how they help us to do uh, uh, let's say, you know, regenerative and developmental biology. I don't know what you can take from the broader sort of big history, social stuff into that area. Maybe, I just don't know. We haven't, we haven't done it. Fair enough. Uh, somebody else was curious, what, uh, what's the mechanism for pattern persistence in the morphogenic space? Like why do certain, uh, arrangements persist and others, others do not? You mean uh, on an evolutionary time scale? I, th- or I, th- on a- I think it might just have an evolutionary answer to it. Now that I, now that I'm thinking about well, it, well, but I mean, is that the scale, or are they asking about um, on a um, on a on an on a ontogenic scale? Like, why does your body persist even though cells come and go? Mm, I think the second, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the latter, I think, is more is more um, of an unusual question. It's really interesting. So, so I've been, I've been, um, I haven't published it yet, but I've been writing this thing on um, this kind of uh, biological ship of Theseus kind of thing, right? And the and the interesting thing about the ship of Theseus is that what's important about it isn't the ship. What's important about it are the the little the little uh, uh, guys who who maintain the thing because they because what the ship really is is an invariant. In the collective intelligence of these of, of whoever it is that's moving the boards around, right? They they have to understand what they're they have to understand it, but they have to they have to they have to they have to have a a vector towards the final outcome. They have to be putting it in a correct place. It's the so, it, the, the sh- it's the object concept duality. Uh yeah, I mean, to, uh, as far as I know, I I'm not I I'm not there may be things that I don't know what you mean, but. Well, just in the sense that, like the the ship, with the the paradox of the ship of Theseus is that, like, if you replace every single plank, do you still have the same ship? And it's like you don't have the same object anymore, but you still have a ship because the concept of a ship has a specific shape. And, and right, yes, and and sort of fun- functionally, it's because that. So so, where is this? You know, this this invisible ship. It is it is in the collective intelligence of whoever is maintaining the thing. And the reason that's important. Is because if the ship is our body and we want to make changes, maybe maybe we want to just upkeep it and not age, or maybe we want to um, metamorphose it into a Theseus submarine or something, um, right? Uh, right. The um, your target is not the boards, and it's not the it's not right, which is which is what molecular medicine today does, is it aims at the boards. Your target is the perception of whoever it is that's swapping them out. Because you want to convince that collective intelligence to do something different, do it better, do it differently, change it into something else. So that, that, that's, that's another one of these things where these wacky sort of philosophical ideas actually point you to a new direction in, in, in biomedicine. Because now you're asking, ah, so, so the cells that come and go during, during the life of the body, what decides where the replacements go? And can we convince, can we, can we communicate with that layer and convince it to do something? something better or different or or whatever so so part of that information is stored uh, bioelectrically part of it is biomechanical part of it is, is 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 biochemical but all of it is a kind of memory in the collective intelligence of the other cells and that's a really important target for medical intervention do you have other ones um yeah i'm trying to parse them as we go but you know, I think there's a more generalized question here about just maybe maybe this is a good place to wrap up. But how does this concept of bioelectric fields how how might it be playing out at larger scales? Are there bioelectric fields that all of humanity is somehow impacted by that's feeding back upon us? Um, can can you make any speculation about moving that concept beyond the organism to a different gauge? Um, two, two ways to think about it, uh, with respect to actual bioelectric, uh, fields of the kind that we study, n- no, the molecular, that, that particular biophysical mechanism d- d- doesn't, as far as we know, doesn't exist at a larger scale. Um, although, although people have studied, which is a different phenomenon, but maybe in some way related, people have studied planetary scale, you know, um, uh, Schumann resonances and other kinds of, you know, geomagnetic fields. It's, it's a different thing, but, but, but people have thought about this, this kind of thing. However, um, I don't, I don't think that, uh, these bioelectric dynamics have magic in themselves. I think what's important about them is that it's one way it, they're a kind of cognitive glue. They're, they're a mechanism that enables competent subunits to become a, a, a larger emergent cognitive whole with goals and preferences and and hopes and dreams and whatnot that doesn't belong to any of the individual pieces. Mm. I, I don't think it is the only cognitive glue. There are no doubt there are others. So so it doesn't have to be particularly bioelectrical, but those same kind of dynamics and 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 I've been working hard to sort of lay out what they are and they have to do with um uh with 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 memory sharing and stress propagation and some other stuff that we don't have time to get into now um those kinds of things can absolutely be implemented by other mechanisms at other scales so so you know i thought about whole evolutionary lineages as a single um individual where each particular animal is a hypothesis made by that individual that will be, you know in the in the firstonian sort of sense um so you can think about that kind of stuff uh you can definitely scale it up and it won't be specifically bioelectrical that that notion of well, what properties does that cognitive glue need to have 
will will all will be there. And so we should look for those. We should look for those larger systems because we might be part of part of one. I love I love the implications of your work. I love that you're thinking about these questions. I, I think that it's so I I I'm not saying this very well. I rem- when I was writing my thesis, I tried to write about will in the opening chapters. And it was so difficult because I hadn't found your work and I hadn't found the language of it in order to be able to put it onto cells. And so at the time it felt very transgressive because I'm trying to convince my thesis advisor that this is a legitimate way of perceiving it. And he's like, no, no, we don't do that. And so I feel like I've been looking for this kind of exploration for my entire intellectual life. And I'm so grateful for the fact that you are doing it and you are doing it so so carefully and and openly and so oh. thank you thank you for coming for for, thank you for so giving much. us your time it's wonderful thank you thank you no that's very kind thank you and um i, I really appreciate having the <clears throat> having the conversation um lots of fun um anytime happy to happy to chat anytime excellent awesome we'll catch up down the road thank you so much very good okay right. thank you have both. a great have a good day. Day. talk soon